right, so we're letting people filter in into the Zoom. All right, hello everyone. My name is Morgan and I'm an event coordinator with Politics and Pros, and I'd like to welcome you to PNP Live. This event for the other black girl is in partnership with Tattered Covered Books, Harvard Bookstore, and Books and Books. Each store is offering book plates with your order of a copy of The Other Black Girl. I will soon drop links in the chat for each store's website where you can purchase a copy. A few housekeeping items before we begin. You can ask our speakers a question by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. And we'll try to get to as many of those questions as we can toward the end of the event. But we apologize in advance if we don't have time to address your question. Also, there are auto captions for this event by hitting the live caption button at the bottom of your screen as well. Let's introduce tonight's guests. Zakia Dalila Harris spent ne nearly 30 years in editorial at Knopf Doubleday before leaving to write her debut novel, The Other Black Girl. Prior to working in publishing, Zakia received her MFA in, creating, in creative writing from the New School. Her essays and book reviews have appeared in Guernica and The Rumpus. Harris will be in conversation with Riley Sager, the pseudonym of an author who lives in Princeton, New Jersey. The, he's the author of the forthcoming book, Survive the Night. Riley's first novel, Final Girls, was a national and international bestseller that has been published in more than two dozen countries and won the ITW Thriller Award for Best Hardcover Novel. Sager's subsequent novels, The Last Time I Lied, Lock Every Door, and Home Before Dark, which received the Crimson Scribe Award by Suspense Magazine, were all New York Times bestsellers. Please give our guests a virtual applause. I'll applaud you. Congratulations on The Other Black Girl. Thank you. And so let's just start right in. Tell us a little bit about The Other Black Girl for those who might not know. Absolutely. Um, first and foremost, thank you so much to you, Riley, for being here today. I'm so excited to chat with you. Um, to everyone tuning in right now, so exciting. Um, and thank you to Harvard Bookstore, Politics and Prose, Books and Books. And um, oh my gosh, I always get the last bookstore <laughs> mixed up. Tattered cover. Tattered cover. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. I got you. <laughs> it's been so sweet, y'all. Um, tattered cover. I am just so, so excited um, and really appreciative of your support. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so, okay, the other Black girl is about a young woman named Nella Rogers who has been the only black woman working at a very prestigious publishing house called Wagner Books, lives in the heart of Manhattan. Um, and she's been the only one there. So she's really, really gotten used to withstanding microaggressions, um, lots of comments from her white coworkers, um, just having to, to brave all of that on her own. So she's really excited when Hazel, another young black woman, comes and starts working at the cubicle next to her. Um, so Nella thinks, okay, I have an ally, this is gonna be great, but alas, it is not that easy. It never is that easy. Um, and uh, she starts to experience a few very strange things in the office and begins to wonder if Hazel is really all that she seems. Um, and then unfolding alongside Nella's story are the stories of three other Black women who are all struggling to succeed in very white world of publishing, also in New York City. And they're all bound by one very, very chilling, dark secret. So that, mm. without any spoilers, is The Other Black Girl. And this is a book that is so hard to talk about. Like, yes. <laughs> like I'm, I'm, I'm worried about like dropping a spoiler and just like realizing it like a second too late and going. Oh. <laughs> I got you, I got you. I think I've found a way over the last few weeks or months, I don't know what is time, um, to Circle. dance around yeah. it. So we got this, <laughs> we got this. So yes, you wanted to read a little bit from the book to give people yeah. a taste. Yeah, so I'm just gonna read a little bit from the prologue from the very, very beginning. December, 1983, Grand Central Terminal, Midtown Manhattan. Stop fussing at it now, leave it alone. 
but my nails found my scalp anyway, running from front to back to front again. My reward was a moment of sweet relief, followed by a familiar flood of dry, searing pain. Stop it. Stop it. I'd already learned that the more I scratched, the more it would resemble the burn of a bad perm, a bad perm that had been stung by 50 wasps and then soused with moonshine. My small opportunity for reprieve would come only after the train started moving, when I could finally close my eyes and take comfort in the growing distance between me and New York City. Still, I continued to scrape at the itch incessantly, my attention shifting to another startling concern. We weren't moving yet. My eyes darted to the strip of train platform visible through the open doors, my mind moving faster than I'd moved through Grand Central Terminal just minutes earlier. What if someone followed me here? Slowly, carefully, I raised myself up to check. On the left side of the car were a young brunette mother and her baby, clad in matching, itchy-looking red winter coats with black velvet lapels. On the right was a gray-haired, greasy-looking man with his forehead smashed against the glass window, snoring so loudly that I could almost feel the train car shake. We were still the same four we'd been when I ducked into this car five minutes earlier. Good. I exhaled and sat back down on my hands, willing the wave of mild relief that had washed over my brain to wash over my heart, too. But the latter organ hadn't gotten the memo yet, and a sudden flash of a shadow passing by the open door set my brain off again. Did anyone see me get into the cab? What the hell am I doing? What the hell are they doing? I think I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. So this book it is a good morning america book club pick it's yeah. other book club picks it has been literally on every list of the best books of the summer because i've seen them all <laughs> um it's there's a hulu adaptation in the works so on a scale of one to ten how awesome does it feel <laughs> 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 Fourteen thousand seven point two. <laughs> it's really, it's really awesome. I mean, you know, when you're writing and you're in your own bubble and you're like just really into your project, really into your work, you don't really know how people are going to receive it. Like I, I talked to people about this book. I quit my job in publishing to finish this book, um, and you know, I think a lot of people. Uh, try to write books. And I knew in my mind, just knowing from the publishing side that it's really, really hard, no matter, uh, you know, how, how much you put into a book, it's there's so many factors that go into how it's received, how it's, how it's published. So I just did not expect this kind of wave. And I'm just so, so grateful and so excited that people have connected with it so many different kinds of people. So it feels really good. <laughs> <laughs> And you, you really answered, like, my next question was going to be, um, on Tuesday, you shared a picture of you in Times Square. Yes. <laughs> holding the book while behind you on the ABC Jumbotron was your book. I know. And I, it's, I saw that and I'm like, damn, <laughs> that's incredible. <laughs> and so it, it really, I, I was going to think, like, did you, you had no inkling at all when you were writing this book. You were probably just thinking... I just want to finish this book without yeah. any future in mind. No, I mean, you know, I, I'd always wanted to write. I grew up loving writing, um, loving reading, always knew that, but it, it's hard. It's hard to make a living off of being a writer. It's hard to have that discipline. I think the older you get. Um, and once I went into publishing, that's really a, a, a style of life that like you, I felt like I had to really adhere to. So trying to work on my own stuff was got harder, you know, as I, as I uh, rose up, I guess. And so um, leaving to just finally see this through, see my dream through and hoping it would go well. And knowing that I had conversations with friends who were like, oh, that sounds great. But like, that's what friends are for, right? <laughs> you also don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just, and being in Times Square and seeing seeing this this thing up on the jumbotron and remembering like the moment when I decided to quit 
remembering like every decision I've made that led to that moment um, is just like a, it's a whoosh. It's just a whoosh <laughs> of feelings. <laughs> well, so this, I have two questions. So one, you, you mentioned always wanting to be a writer. So was that why you entered the world of publishing with that eventual goal in mind? And then it really sounds like you left publishing to ironically meet that goal. <laughs> yeah. No, you know, I, I did really enjoy editing. I did my MFA in creative writing at the new school in nonfiction writing, actually. I got waitlisted, oh, okay. which is funny. Um, and But it was so good for me. And I really loved it because, I mean, it allowed me to like open up parts of myself that I hadn't really thought about until that time. Um, but it also just like allowed me to have conversations with other writers about their work and like, I had to be okay with criticism. And I'd had my experiences with uh, creative writing classes in undergrad, but it's a different ball game when you're doing an MFA. And there are other writers who also have the same, the same goals, the same plans and dreams. And so being in that space was really good for me. Um, but it also showed me that I really enjoyed editing and enjoyed like just talking about structure and that kind of thing. So when I went into publishing, I definitely was in the mindset that this could be my forever career, um, at least when I started out, because I just loved, I loved that part. I loved being with the page. I loved being behind the scenes too. Um, and, you know, on that side of things. So it's an interesting trajectory. <laughs> so, so now how does it feel to be in front of the camera, so to speak, <laughs> and not behind the scenes? It's, it's, it probably feels very weird. Yeah. <laughs> but also kind of familiar. <laughs> it is. I mean, when I, an example of like my love of being behind the scenes, like I was in set crew in high school, like I was a painter, I took pride in that and like loved being the, the unsung hero and not, you know, being in the forward facing thing. But in, it's been now, I think, an adjustment for me because I love talking to people. Like I love, I worked in a lot of frontward facing jobs. I worked in coffee shops and pie shop and cupcake shop. But um so that's always been a part of me, but really it's just been fun talking about my work. I, and I'm sure you know exactly this feeling, just how, how nice it is to, like you worked on this thing again, you're as a writer, we're oftentimes in our bubbles, but to be able to have these conversations, to have someone point at something and be like, oh, like you did this thing. And then to like be like, wow, I didn't even think about it that way. <laughs> it's like such a good feeling. Yeah, we, we are like it is such when you when you're composing a book and working on a book, it is so solitary. Like yeah. you are just alone with your thoughts. And a lot of times they are not happy thoughts. No. <laughs> and so when you do get a chance to be amongst humans again yes. <laughs> and interact with them, yes. and it's just it's refreshing. Like I I am been a, a full-time writer for several years now so even before the pandemic I was stuck at home most of the time alone working on a book and I would find myself like really chatting up like the grocery store cashier yes. or something yes. just because yes <laughs> Same. and I didn't even realize I was doing it and I'm like I'm they really just want me to pay and leave don't yeah. they <laughs> so events like this we tend to be just like I, 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 because like we just don't get to do it a lot totally totally but I same same I I wrote I was a big coffee shop writer before the pandemic and I was that that way with baristas like all throughout I I feel I felt bad about it but also like I think they were into it I don't know <laughs> not sure it, 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 it probably livened up their day I'm sure yeah <laughs> so publishing now, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to like phrase this delicately, like how much of you is in Nella, but more specifically, how much of her coworkers <laughs> are in your coworkers? And are they like really nervous right now? <laughs> I mean, I won't speak for them, but I will say that I have gotten some really wonderful feedback from all across the board of people that I worked with um, from when the book was on submission to now. Um, and 
when I was writing this, I did not set out, first of all, publishing, critiquing publishing was not like my first idea. I didn't sit down and be like, oh, you know what, you know what the world needs? <laughs> <laughs> and just list out all of the things in the book. That wasn't actually how I went about it. I really was thinking about the, the Black women in this book, um, specifically Nella and Hazel, and what their friendship, what their experience would be like meeting in this very white space. Um, that happened, of course, to be book publishing, because I was working in that world. Um, and I did start this book in my cubicle um, when I was there still. And I really wanted to look at them and how that world, how these, these white eyes, honestly, are looking at them and how that affects how Nella feels about Hazel, how that affects how Hazel responds to Nella, all of their interactions. Um, but the more I wrote, the more I was like, Right, but like publishing is, there's so many problems. Like this is why they have this relationship. It's because, I mean, not specifically publishing. I think that it really can expand to any other industry. Whatever, yeah. You know, and so, so yeah, I, I really wanted to capture the vibe, the kind of old fashionedness, if you will, of publishing itself. I think it's really fascinating the ways it works. And I know not every imprint is the same, but it definitely felt in some ways like we're in like 1950s Mad Men a little bit. Um, yes. And that's also, I think that's part of what I did enjoy about it was there was an earnestness, I think, in a lot of, at least when I entered it, I, I, I truly felt like I loved being a part of this this bigger thing of where can where we have such a big say and what people are talking about, what people are reading. Um, but of course, when I looked around the table as um, I wasn't the only one like Nella in the book, thankfully I had it far better than she did. Um, but I mean, I still was the only black woman full-time uh, person working in editorial. And so looking around the table and again, not seeing other Black women in editorial having these conversations that, of course, that also affected those conversations and what we bought and what we what we valued in a lot of ways and ways that I don't think a lot of people even thought about. But I was thinking about those those things, and so that part really was what I was trying to get into Nella, uh, just what it's like to be in this space, um, to really want this thing too that like she feels this responsibility in a lot of ways to be that black female editor. And I know like I've felt that way with the, this job and with other jobs, like of just like, I'm representing all black people. My being here is going to pave the way. Um, so those were, that was really what I was channeling, but there's no one specific in the book. The funny thing is when um, my agent and I were talking to publishing houses, so many people were like, I know this person, I know this person, I've seen this person, <laughs> I am this person. Like I've gotten so many, so much feedback like that. And that's really what I wanted to capture, just how it's just an amalgamation of, you know, all of the different personalities. Well, what's it's interesting you mentioned about like, you know, Nella is the only black person in that office. And she does have to bear this pressure and this weight that she shouldn't have to bear right and then you know in walks hazel and she thinks finally I, I i can sort of we'll bond and we will share this weight together and maybe we'll just conquer this place mm -hmm. and that's not quite what happens yeah <laughs> and so hazel is, is is fascinating because i know from you know my experience working in the world of journalism and, and different newsrooms, there's always that one coworker that you just can't get a read on. Mm. Is that like, yes. what is her deal? Yes. Like, why, what, what's her deal? And you can never yeah. quite figure it out. And that's, Hazel has that. So like, how did you go about writing her character? Yeah, oh, that's such a good, that's such a good way of describing it because I think that's so right. I think that is common. I'm thinking of every job I've ever had now and like that one person. And there's always that one. There's always that one. And and it's extra loaded with Nell and Hazel, of course, because Nella is like, we're both black and we made it here. Like we should be, I thought we would be friends. And yeah, I mean, so thinking about Hazel, Hazel came from a lot of things. I Hazel came from my own anxieties that I had when I was younger about being a black person who had mostly grown up around 
white people, um, which is another thing I share with Nella, um, just kind of that being used to navigating those spaces um, and what that means for her, her, her sense of self, what it means for her confidence. And so, I mean, I had experiences as a young person when I got to high school of like, other black people saying I talk like a white girl or like why are you participating so much like those kind of things um and those got to me as a young person and I still think about them and, and those are the things I was writing about when I did my MFA I mentioned earlier like exploring those kind of parts of me and so I think for me Hazel really is the thing that the person that Nella felt like she had in her the, the, the she's the person that was in from her past I think the people who would tell her you're you're not down enough you're not this enough you're not that enough um in a lot of ways but also Hazel's not that there's a lot of other stuff going on too there is some um there's just a lot of mixed signals I guess try not to spoil but um so that complexity and that relationship um that is just like hot and cold and it's especially I think exacerbated by the fact that they're in this like office space. Um, remember what an office is like? Uh, I, I <laughs> and, do, not anymore, no. <laughs> <laughs> but like all of the, when you, even besides the fact that there are two black women, when you take any office environment like that, it's a bubble, it's such an interesting, it's got its own ecosystem, it's got its own subtext, everything. So what that's like and how that also influences Nella's kind of anxieties and um, kind of dashed hopes, I guess, in terms of what she's expecting to get out of Hazel. And the, the, the flip side of that is Nella's relationship with her best friend. Yeah. And that is so warm and loving and supportive. And I'm so glad you put that into the book mm -hmm. because it is, it is that provides that much needed balance to the really fraught relationship that Nella had with Hazel. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really what I wanted. I mean, this book is also like about work-life balance and how kind of what not to do, I guess. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I wanted to show how oppressive and how heavy Wagner books can be, but also just like Nella has a life and who she is outside of those walls is really important too. And it's in fact, you know, it, it shows what's at stake even with what happens here at the book. Like you, you know that she has people, you know that she's not, she's, she has friends, like she is a functioning person, but at Wagner, there's something about it that keeps her from being that fully realized person. So yeah, I wanted to, to include those, those moments of like, getting getting really drunk on a Tuesday like when you know you have to go to work but it's like at this point you're like you know what I need to find joy where I can um <laughs> that kind of thing and just all of the references um and just that 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 what beautiful black friendship can look like uh because I didn't want it to be just this like oh hazel and and I, I'd like to think she's also not you know the bad bad character I think she's Hopefully she came, comes across as nuanced and has reasons for also why she is the way she is. I think she does, yeah. I think she did come across as very <laughs> nuanced and balanced. But the book, so it is genre defying in the best way. And it's a, so it's, it's sort of publishing world satire, um, dark comedy, and that's, that's one thing I was not expecting before I started reading it is that it is funny in part. Like it is like laugh out loud funny. And I'm just like, it's great. It's that, it's, you know, it's thriller. It's even horror, some sci-fi maybe. I So it's like, how hard was it to sort of balance all of these different things in this just, expert tightrope walk that you did yeah. like it's 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 pretty it's yeah. really impressive thank you I, it was pretty hard i mean i think i think for me a lot of the the funniness and the jokes and the conversations are just conversations i have they, i was really mirroring them after conversations i've had with my friends with my black girlfriends with my white partner um with the nella and owen sections i mean 
I, I, I like to just, I, I like to make references and kind of poke fun at things, but I also like wanted to show just all of the ways in which, you know, the, that especially Nell and Malika are able to function and have a wonderful relationship despite all of the things happening in the world. And um, I know for me, the book was really, keeping the funniness in there was important for me because it can be really dark, uh, <laughs> pretty dark <laughs> in some parts. Uh, and having that levity was important to me. But also I, I have to say, I am a big um, horror fan too, a big mm -hmm. uh, sci-fi thriller, like grew up watching Are You Afraid of the Dark, loved Goosebumps, um, loved like all of those kind of shows and, and uh, books that start off in our world, but then go down a rabbit hole, uh, like Blue Velvet also, just like Ooh, Rosemary's yes. Baby, the kind of slow burn. Um, I'm always, I love that. I love that in a story, no matter what kind of format it is. And so I knew from the get-go that this book would have those kind of uh, creepier elements. Uh, I wasn't exactly sure in what form, but I just knew, I knew how it would end. And I knew that there were things happening that the reader would find out about later on. <laughs> well, that's, I was, I was just gonna get to that. Like, were, were some of these things a surprise? Like, you know, like, we're like, okay, this this is getting more horror-y than maybe I intended to, or this is getting more thrillery than I intended to. And yeah, you have to pull back sometimes. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I have to, and honestly, I really had to pull back on the office, the workspace, because that I, I when I first wrote a draft, it was all Nella's point of view. Um, we there The other characters were in it, but it was all through Nella's perspective. Um, and it's a lot of office stuff. And I feel like that can get really heavy for a reader. Um, it's, it, I, I didn't, I knew I didn't have that in me and my, my agent and my editor, we, were had really good discussions about how to trim and how to make sure that it it flowed and we got to the the thrillery aspect sooner because because I did when I first wrote it 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 wasn't it wasn't seated in quite as as well of course like it was an early draft and we really had to work out how to make that work and so um, yeah, it definitely surprised me um, the the twist there are a couple twists but like. The main twist was also a surprise. It came from a conversation with my partner, actually, um, where I was like, I have all of these pieces, but like, I'm curious about this piece and like, what do you think? And like, okay, we would talk out a lot of plot points too when I was like in the early, early stages before I had an agent. And, and that really helped And just like reading. I mean, I was, I remember rereading Gone Girl and um, also Passing by Nella Larson um, was a big influence for this book. And so, I don't know, I was just trying to also channel other, other things too that did it so beautifully of kind of slipping in these kind of elements because it's hard, it's hard. Like, I'm, I mean, you're like, you're so good at it. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of work and a lot of trial and error and a lot of just really messing up sometimes and being like, why did I ever think that this particular thing would work? Yeah. And then you just find your way to the thing that does work. Totally. Well, I think messing up is, that's so important. I think you're so right. I, I needed to get that draft out. I needed to figure out what not to do. And a lot of it was like, if I take this and put this here, all right. So this means this for the reader, but then this part is like not as impressive here. So like a lot of just like Jenga of all those parts. That, that is a perfect analogy <laughs> right there, Jenga. So <laughs> what, when I was reading and you did seed it very well because like when I, when I realized what was going on and that's all I'll say about it, but I just, <laughs> I, I was like, oh so this is why this conversation happened and this conversation happened and why this scene took place and why and and it just and it just was like that kind of -da, kind of <laughs> feeling and i'm like wow that's that's smart and then my my other response was that's so audacious <laughs> what's going on in this book is audacious and i so i just like when I got to the thing that we're not going to talk about it, like, I just was like, 
<laughs> well, well done. Well played. That means so much coming from you. Oh my gosh. Audacious. I love it. I think that should be, we need, I'm going to use that word. <laughs> like it, it, it really is. And was, was there a fear that maybe like, did you have any second thoughts about that? Totally. Totally. I mean, it's, it's not something that I think really happens. I mean, if I, if I may be so bold, it's like coming up with comps for the book was really difficult. Um, Get Out was the the first thing that came to mind for me when I was querying agents. Cause I was like, okay, well, cause that movie for me, I don't remember what the trailer was like. I'm sure the trailer was like pretty creepy. Uh, I'm sure it had the song, but I remember it starting out and like, of course the title I knew, but it does start off in this way that's like, you know, it's just the couple going to see her parents. And of course it's charged because of course, black man, white woman, but I still kind of got lulled into that a little bit. And so then to have those little elements, I mean, the deer at the very beginning, I think it was a deer and then little bits here and there was really satisfying for me. And that, that I had the same moment of like, that's why that was important. That's why he looked a little too long in him in that weird way. Like all of those things are so, for me, so satisfying as a consumer. Yeah, the silent auction was for like, with that, yeah, that movie is just, is so, so good. Yeah. I gotta watch it again. Watch it everyone if you haven't seen it yet. <laughs> so since, since we're talking about um, film and television, let's talk about the the Hulu thing. Mm -hmm. Now, how involved are you in the process of it's going to be a they're trying to adapt it into a TV show, correct? TV show. Yeah, yeah. I have been co writing the pilot with Rashida Jones, um, which has been so much fun. So, 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 so much fun. So much learning. Um, so much like having to pull back uh in ways that as a writer i'm not used to doing on um, you know for prose and um but it's been really fun they wanted me from the get-go to really be a part of it as much as i wanted to be they wanted me to to co-write it and so to off the bat have that kind of confidence or feel like that kind of confidence was felt in me um made me just like awesome be like this is great but i will say at first at the very very beginning of all those conversations i was nervous because it's your baby, right? Like you're, right. you don't know. I didn't, when I wrote it, I didn't have any ideas of it being adapted. Uh, I just was like, book, cool. If, if it becomes a book, I'll take it. Uh, so seeing how that could be turned into a TV show um, was hard for me a little bit at first, but the more I talked to people and the more that I, we explored each character and just possible threads, I was just like, of course, like this makes so much sense. We can go deeper in places we couldn't before. Okay, so just side note, Rashida Jones appreciation moment here. <laughs> yes. I mean, she's just, she's such a good actress. And Best. she's also such an amazing writer. Mm -hmm. And she was Ann Perkins on Parks and Recreation. And yes. so that is, <laughs> you are living the dream right now with working with her. That's so cool. I am, I am. And the thing that's been so great about it is that like going into it, she was like, so excited about it so enthusiastic and like I want to help you through this process like this is going to be this is going to be great we like we're going to work together and coming into it in that way and of course it stayed that way throughout has been really fulfilling because I don't know that world at all and you just don't know and I feel like I've heard horror stories about writers being on the other side of it um in the film TV space and none of that happened to me. None of that has happened. I've, I've just been really fortunate uh, to, to have that. So excited. But, well, that is, that is that is awesome because I, I too have heard those horror stories and that's why like people have asked like, oh, would you want to adapt one of your books or would you? And it's like, no, I'm good. Right. I don't want to, it's, it's just, yeah. it's, I would love to secretly, but it also terrifies me this idea of working in like, you know, I finally got a grasp on how publishing works. Right. <laughs> it's like, oh, now I have to learn how Hollywood works too. Like that's, that's too intimidating for me. I'll just stay in my room here. Yeah. <laughs> so what is, what books, movies, TV shows like inspire you? And especially what books, movies, and TV shows maybe inspired the other black girl? You 
did already mention a couple of them, but were there any more? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, Kindred by Octavia Butler was a big one for me. I read that for the first time in high school. And so um, as a 17 year old reading that kind of book about slavery in a time when all you're reading about slavery is, you know, essays and memoirs and or autobiographies and just those kinds of accounts. Um, so to read a book where it's literally picking up someone from, I mean, it's, I think it was, it's set in the seventies, but it still feels very current. Um, so picking someone up from present day and putting them into that context, it was like, it's like, wow, what? And that's audacious. To that me. is audacious, <laughs> yes. With a capital um, A. With a capital A. Um, so, so that's one book, I mean, so many, uh, Issa Rae inspires me. I think for her to, for her to come on the scene when she did for me, uh, I mentioned earlier, like my nervousness about not being black enough as a young person, but seeing her um, show Awkward Black Girl on YouTube, like back when I was in college was such a game changer for me because I don't know, it was just this one other example of, of blackness, one other example of a black woman trying to figure out lots of different stuff. And it's not only about her being a black woman, it's also just about her being a woman. And it just, to me, seemed really revolutionary. So so she inspires me. Um, and yeah, I mean, Key and Peele also, we talked about Get Out, but there is a Key and Peele sketch that also kind of informed this work. I mean, I don't remember when I saw it. It was definitely years before I started writing this, but there was like an acapella group episode where um, I can't remember which one starts off in the acapella group, but it's basically this acapella group of white guys. And one of them is like the one who sings at the end, like bum, 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 you know, like the, those old school, like <laughs> lines mm -hmm. the night kind of acapella songs. Um, and he's the only black person in the group. And then the other, the other one comes into the room and they're like, what's up, Chad? And then they have this moment where they just like look at each other <laughs> and it's like, it's on. Cause they're, they're nervous and feel like their spots have been threatened. And P and Peel, sorry, that was a long tangent, but- No, they, I, they're both brilliant. They're brilliant. The conversations that they have uh, are not necessarily in your face, but the, the things that they're also audacious, I guess, because I, I really do think that they talk about um, blackness and our own nuances in a way that for me was really satisfying because like those feel like in jokes that I have talked about with other black people but I don't see as much in that kind of space I mean I stand up comedians it's different and um, there's something magical to me about them so there there are a couple people um and then I mean I could go on <laughs> I feel like maybe I probably satisfied the <laughs> so as as I I've, as I've, I've tried to get started on Twitter it is hashtag hot book summer. Yes. There, there is an insane amount of amazing books coming out this summer. So many. So uh, what are you reading? What have you read that you've just loved? Yeah, I mean, I haven't, I haven't gotten to get started on any of the summer books yet, um, but I have been reading All Her Little Secrets by Wanda Morris, which comes out in November. Um, it starts with, I mean, I'm still starting, started it I'm working my way trying to do everything but it's so immediately immersive it starts with a black woman who is a lawyer finding her white lover who is also her boss um who is also married I believe um she finds him dead in the office and then it's just like you're off um and I just it's so fun I cannot wait to dip into it this summer um it's also you know workplace politics uh that kind of, to me, it has a sort of, um, maybe not Hitchcockian, but just that setup where it starts, that's not a spoiler, what I just said, it literally starts, that <laughs> happens right in the beginning. So it's on. Um, so that's one book. And then um, I started reading The Prophets by Robert Jones Jr., well, which is that, yes. uh, so good. It's so good. It's just so beautiful and so rich. Um, really, really. And unlike anything I've read before. Um, and again, um, talking about slavery, viewing slavery through a lens that I haven't seen before um, through two gay black men, um, it's just remarkable. So so those are a couple of things, but it's it's hard. It's hard to, 
there's so many things I have. I'm like looking around my room and I just have stacks of books, various places. And you've been very, very, very busy. <laughs> and and, and now, now we come to the very silly question I promised yeah. that I would ask. I'm so excited. Because um, for, for context, everyone, I, we were talking before the show and I said, you've done so many interviews now and have <laughs> been asked probably like, had to answer the same questions over and over and over again. And so I tried to think up of a question that I am certain that you haven't been asked yes. yet. Yes. And, yes. and it, it is silly. I'm nervous. <laughs> no, it, no, but here it is. And I, I defy anyone to ask you this at any other book event. Who is your favorite Muppet? <laughs> Oh, it could be from from Muppet Show, Sesame Street, Fraggle Rock, even if you want to go yeah. there. But you, you do. Oh man, I'm I'm I know this isn't the point of it, but I wish I'd been prepared because I would have. <laughs> <laughs> I think okay, this is maybe lame. I feel like everyone probably says this, but Kermit the Frog, Kermit the Frog is I think my favorite uh, for a couple of reasons. He's green, and my favorite color is green. Um, <laughs> Bonus I also, point right there in his favor. Yes, and I also remember when I was in elementary school. I remember I was in chorus, and I so I guess I was in front of the. I was not behind the scenes in that case. That was an interesting time in my life uh, <laughs> when I was like seven. But I remember one song we had to learn was the Rainbow Connection, and I think that song is just. I don't know. It's, it's kind of listening to it again now. It doesn't, it's not quite the same, but it, it still kind of pulls at my heartstrings a little bit. And I just can hear, this is weird, but I can hear our, our child voices singing, trying to sing those high notes. In the <laughs> <laughs> so I think, her, and also like his relationship no, is, with Miss Piggy that, is like, it's so fraught and, but he, they still seem to it seems like such a real relationship and he's he's still here for Miss Piggy. So anyway, that's my that's my answer. That's what his he's mine too. Yeah. He's, yeah. He's just, he's just he's just he is joy personified. He's so likable. Yeah. He's yeah. So, so so there we go. Now we'll get to like real questions <laughs> from from the audience in the QA. Love it. <laughs> I love that so much. Thank you. <laughs> so here we go. Um let's see. I'm gonna sort of scroll down and some of these we might have covered before. Oh, here's a good one from Audrey. Huge congrats on the book, loving this conversation. Could you share a bit about your writing process? Yeah, yes, thank you for the question. That's a good question. Um, my writing process, um, it has changed a lot. I think for the other black girl because it was the kind of thing that came came to me very quickly and is the rare thing that I kept up with. Like I, I got so into it because I have had other ideas before I was working on a different novel before this one that I just couldn't get to work. And so I will say that this one happened a little differently for me, but that being said, um, I definitely had for this book a regimen. I knew that I quit my job to finish this book. So I felt like I had something to prove if for anyone for myself. And so I'd wake up early in the morning. Um, for some time I was uh, working at a cupcake shop and so I had to wake up at like the crack of dawn. So I'd wake up before that. Um, and then later on I was part-time teaching. And so I would stay after right in Central Park and write and um, often write by hand uh, for when I'm like really starting fresh. Uh, after I mentioned earlier, I'd written a full draft of just Nella's voice. And then I was like, oh, I need other people and the other women to, to be heard in this book. So those scenes, I remember really writing those cold and like by hand, crossing things out. Like that for me was really necessary because I don't know, not having the whole book in front of me too was really helpful of just like, I'd have a pad of paper. And so really just writing, 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 um, and then going back and finding those mistakes, finding the things that don't work as well and thinking, oh, like, again, we're talking like, like fiddling with it. Um, those parts came after for me because the hardest part for me, and I'm, I'm curious about you, Riley, like for me, it's like the hardest part, it can be getting the story down and not trying to get it perfect. 
perfect the right like the first time um because I get hung up in that and it's like no you you have to let yourself mess up that is my my biggest hurdle is getting over that mental block like this doesn't have to be perfect right now and yeah. if I can feel that it's veering in a direction I don't want it to go or it's not where I think my best right is like it's hard to just yeah. be like okay just keep writing you'll get over that bump and yeah and sometimes I will be like it's a stupid like a single scene mm -hmm. yeah hanging up for like a week or two yes and I hate I know. that I know that is my worst fault yeah but I, I love what you said about writing because I do find that just writing by hand in a notebook unlocks a part of the brain that we don't really use and it does yeah. it'll let things just flow a little bit better so much that unlocking is is really key it's also not having tabs <laughs> it's a good thing yes. Yes. <laughs> so here's one from clarice do you plan on continuing with the fiction genre or have you considered nonfiction, biography or other topics you know clarice thank you i haven't gotten that question um that's a really good question I, yeah, I mean, I'm still thinking about my next, my next project. Um, I, I imagine it's fiction. I imagine black characters. Um, that's really right now, everything else is swirling around in my head. It depends what day you ask me, um, really what I'm thinking for next. But I also have a lot of, I mean, that part of what's been really fun about working on this book is that I've gotten to write pieces, um, uh, nonfiction pieces that I started trying to write in at the new school. I did my uh, my thesis with personal essays, and, and a lot of them had to do with race and my blackness and how I was how I kind of learned learned to to love my natural hair. How I learned to kind of understand how all of these things have affected my my childhood have affected who I am today. So that's been really fun um, unlocking that part too. So so that's that's my long kind of diplomatic answer. Definitely mm -hmm. though. I love exploring, you know, the the world of these characters for the TV show, and so that's that's really the thing that I'm excited about right now is like living in that world too. So several people have asked, like, is there a second novel waiting around to be to be written, or have you not even thought about it yet? You know, I can't lie and say I haven't thought about it um, because. Yeah, I think I think a lot of writers do think about the the where the world could keep going. I mean, I also end in a place that's like a lot of stuff is. Yeah, I'm just gonna say that. Um, <laughs> but mm -hmm. but yeah, no, I mean, I, I've thought about it, but still figuring it out. You know, again, the the TV show is really allowing me to explore the characters and not their afterlives, but like <laughs> just the ways in which we can see more of them. Um, so I'm really, really getting my kicks through through that right now. But once things are less crazy, I do feel like things will be much clearer and I'll hopefully, I'm hoping, we'll see. <laughs> so here's here's a, a good one. And here's one that you've probably, um, this is from Abiola. And um, they are going to ask a question that you probably haven't been asked before, but they said yeah. you were wearing a brilliant pair of earrings in your conversation yeah. with Britt Bennett earlier in the week. Yes. And she wants to know where you got them from. Yes. Um, I'm actually seeing if I, and I actually, I don't have the ones I was wearing, but I do have a yellow pair that I also own. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> they <were used>, <laughs> um, they're 3D printed. They are from Etsy. Um, oh, I should by now have the name of the company on my mind but i can um i don't know if i can put it in the chat but if you if you uh etsy i almost said google if you etsy <laughs> um the like fist pick earrings i guarantee you'll find them they're um they're also oh the thing i'll add is on my instagram page if you scroll down there's a picture of the book on a park bench the finished copy of the us edition on a park bench with these earrings i tagged the company. Um, I feel so bad. I can't remember their name, but check them out. They're really light and they also work for your, oh, okay. I'm going to, I'm going to drop the link while, while Riley reads maybe the next question. <laughs> um, do, do you think your work with, this is from Catherine. Mm -hmm. Do you think your work with authors in editorial helped you see yourself as an author and, you know, made it 
easier to work with your editor? Oh, that's a really good question too. Um, yeah, I think so. I think so. I, I for sure, I, I, I'm not gonna lie. I was absolutely, I loved working with authors. That was really my favorite part um, of a lot of ways of like getting to like send covers to hear their feedback about finished copies. All of that was such a such a fun part. But I also was like pretty envious too. I was like, this is so exciting. You're publishing a book. Um, and yeah, I do think, I do think that has informed my own experiences. I mean, I I know that I I know that my bosses both had um, really wonderful relationships with their authors and I know every author is different. Every author wants something different from an editor. Um, but I know when I met Lindsay um, Sagnat at Atria, like it was just a chemistry and um, a vibe that I had seen at the office I worked at. Um, and I knew that that's what I wanted because I like to be able to talk to my person and have like really honest conversations about my writing that that was really that was really cool too just having an editor having someone who really really cared and knew and felt the characters and got the mission from the beginning um so definitely definitely and it's it's the editor author relationship is so important yes and you you just need to have like you, you said like my person and yeah you need that person that you can trust wholeheartedly. And yeah. that sometimes, you, you, you know, you can push back against things like the, with, with, with Final Girls, there was like something I disagreed with, with my editor yeah. and I just was like so meek and she's like, ooh, are we gonna fight? Let's fight. <laughs> and I was just, it just was like, you know, and it, it was just so refreshing to just be like, okay, let's, let's be honest with each other and let's, totally. let's really try to make this the best book it can possibly be together. Right. No, absolutely. Sorry, I put the wrong link. There we go. Ignore that other link. That was me listening and not copying and pasting the right way. <laughs> totally. totally. And I think that's the thing too, is with, with Nella, Nella's also Nella's problem is that she can't speak up a lot of the time. And I mean, when she does things go awry, we know there's a reason why she doesn't speak up. But I also know for me, like, that's something I'm figuring out too, is like how to speak up um, just in general. Um, and that's what I, I'm trying to do. And I just feel like to feel like you have a space where you can is so important too for yeah. an author and, and feel like you'll be heard and there'll be a dialogue. So that's what I have. And it's, again, I couldn't be luckier. Here is a question from Karen, and this is an interesting one. Do you think your book opens the conversation and acceptance of the real diversity among Black women in the office place? Yeah, I hope so. I mean, these characters are not all great all the time, <laughs> for one. Um, they can be very messy. They can be, they can say the wrong thing at the wrong time. Um, and and I really wanted to, to convey that of how important it is to look at us as individuals. Because I, I think that the, the one thing that I, I mean, there are lots of things I want readers to take away, but besides the fact that we're not a monolith as black women, as black people, it's also the fact that the ways in which um, diversity and those kind of buzzwords can be commodified, how it's, we simplify this idea of what it's like to, what it means to be diverse. And diversity doesn't mean just putting one person into the space and being like, awesome, we're, we're good now. Um, it means understanding each person as they are and knowing that everyone has different needs and everyone need, has different um, lines. Nella needs to feel like Nella does need a little more space. Hazel, on the other hand, is able to kind of roll with it, although there's more, but <laughs> there's more, yeah. there's more. Um, <laughs> but like we are not, some of us are, some of us can handle, you know, all of, all of that and we can put up a good facade, but I think still at the end of the day, like we can only do so much and it would be really great for us to, to be able to just be and not be standing for every black person on the planet when we're the only one. Um, and then when Hazel comes standing for being compared to Hazel. Um, like Nella never gets to be an individual really. So 
So that's what I hope so. I hope so. And I hope if not, at least I hope that gets these kinds of conversations started because I think they're really important to have. And I think you, you, you do a really great job in the book of just really expressing Nella's, that, that feeling of not quite isolation and not, but just you, you are representing an entire group, this one person who is an individual and, and her, her frustration at, at having to carry that throughout her professional life. And yeah. it's something we white people don't really have, have to think about. Like we, we just, we, we don't. And it's, it's very eye-opening. And I, I hope it will be eye-opening to a lot of the white readers who do read the book to be like, wow, yeah, that's, that's a whole level of stress and pressure that we do not have to deal with. And yeah. it's, you, you do it so well in this book. Thank you. Thank you. That, that really means a lot to me. And, and that's, that's another, yeah, that's a part, that's a big part that I wanted people to take away from it, publishing houses to take away from just anyone who is in the position to, who has control over office environments and workplace environments. It's not just, again, we talked about this, but it's not just publishing, it's, it's education. Take your pick. Yeah. Music. yeah, it's a music industry, I think, in its own way, this kind of tokenization happens across um, I almost said genres. <laughs> Tokenization happens across all spaces and got to find a way to, again, have these conversations. So I think we have time for one more question. This, this is from Ariel, who you know. Oh, I've heard um, <laughs> Who was your favorite character to write? Ooh. And is there a character that shared any traits with people you know in real life? Yes. That would be surprised to hear they inspired a character in the book. Yeah. You said you don't have to name names, but <laughs> we, we want you to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. I, well, the, the first person that came to mind isn't really someone based on any particular people. I think Kendra Ray for me was really fun because she, the, so she kind of Ray, uh, really quickly, she's the black editor who worked at Wagner many, many years, well, 30 years, not that many, before Nella. Um, and she edited this very big, important um, book that was written by a black author. And so their collaboration really means a lot to Nella in the book. Um, but I, I liked her because she's feisty and she, she's everything in a lot of ways that I'm not. Um, and to be able to to do that um, through writing was really fun. And then I'd also say Malika, who um, is an amalgamation of a lot of different uh, black girlfriends I have from college and then being in New York. Um, I have to shout out Sincere, my, one of my good, good friends from the new school who a lot of our conversations, a lot of conversations I've had with a lot of different friends have made into the book, but I do feel like I was thinking a lot about all the conversations we have. And sometimes we just like go there when it's just us talking. And it was fun to do that with, with Malika and, and show this, this other side of Nella that's like a little spicier because Malika's got a little more like oomph and brings out that side of Nella that we, again, we don't get to see at Wagner. So, so those are my two, those are my two. <laughs> and anyway. I I, I did think that the relationship and and when you know to touch on the 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 humor of the book again, like they really serve the story well because you sort of let your guard down a little bit yeah. until the dangerous stuff like yeah. comes into play. And it's it's just it's it is so well done. Thank and congratulations you. on everything. Thank you. Thank you so much. This has been such a delight. Oh my gosh. I really Thank you so much for inviting me to do this. I had a blast. Me too. All right. We want to thank you um, both for doing this event with us. Politics and Prose, Tattered Covered Books, Books and Books, and Harvard Bookstore. Uh, we were grateful that you all could be with us tonight. And also those who are watching, thank you for attending this virtual event. All the links are in the chat so where you, so you can pick which bookstore you'd like to buy your book from and they all have book plates available as well as the link for the 
beautiful earrings are also in the chat. <laughs> and we would like to wish you a good evening. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you.